Rosso in Portsmouth and elsewhere. He joins me today to talk about how we, how we launched the enterprise and his plans for expansion. My guest is Glenn Wolf Cyril of Calibishi, more popularly known as the Cassava Man. Uh, my friend, welcome to Anupali. I'm happy to have you here, Mr. Cyril. What do I call it? I call it Cassava Man or Mr. <laughs> Cyril or Glenn Wolf? I, I, I like Cassava Man. The Cassava Man. I like the Cassava Man. Well, welcome. How, how, how is Calibishi these days? Uh, when I left today, it was, it was quite bubbly. Sunday afternoon is a chill out afternoon in Calibishi. Mm -hmm. It's a nice place. Yeah. So it's, it's good. Excellent. Nice good. And I'm sure your mom and your sister and, and, and the rest of them are, are, oh, yeah, are listening. They, 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 they tuned in. They tuned in. They tuned in. They now, tuned in. now, tell us about your business and, and what do you offer to the public? Yeah, well, what I do is I do cassava bread mainly, mm -hmm. but I also do um, basically we do farin cassava bread and we do cassava mash. So presently we work in, in town where we do cassava bread at different varieties, different flavors. Mm -hmm. We do raisin, ginger, cranberry, banana, um, pineapple, chocolate, and the plain one for people that don't like sweet. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we just newly introduced the cassava wrap, which is a, a bomb right now in, in the country. Excellent. No. You, you have taken advantage of the niche market um, with um, the cassava products. Uh, you, you, you're now in town, um, in a busy, busy part of town, um, like the old market area, the yeah. Sufria bus stop, Scottsdale bus stop. How is this going? It is, it is, sometimes it's overwhelming because, they, like, like you say, it's a busy part of town, and I guess the product is that good also. Mm. So we get there from about 7.30, and from 7.30 to up till 3, 4 o'clock at times, we have a steady flow of people coming and, and buy different um, flavors and different varieties of cassava bread from us. So people are responding to this? Definitely. They, they, they love the vibes even. On Friday, we left our original spot to work at, at WeChurch and we had a few customers come and, and make a little complaint saying that you leave us dry. But they, that's, uh, that, that's the feedback we get when working in town. Uh, and, and the, the clientele is growing? Oh, definitely. It is definitely growing, especially with the new introduction of the cassava wrap. The wrap. We just expanded our, our clientele. And no, our what's this wrap about? Tell, can you tell us about the wrap? I mean, uh, what do you put in it? The, the cassava wrap, initially it started, a friend of mine sent me a message of, uh, she sent me a, a picture showing me uh, somebody doing cassava sandwich. And I'm like, but mm -hmm. hey, I have something even better than the sandwich coming out. Mm -hmm. And it so happened that it was in the independent season. Mm -hmm. And I, in my mind, it was the best time to, to launch that, that, that product. The, the cassava wrap really is a, a cassava-based skin mm -hmm. where we use the, the cassava bread, the base of the cassava bread. We make a thin skin mm -hmm. and we wrap the, the cassava with um, cheese, with ham, with bacon, with salt fish, with smoked fish, smoked chicken, smoked pork, and we have a very special one coming out this Friday. Okay. Anybody that could guess that <laughs> special one on Friday, they'll get one free of this special and one of their choice. One of their choice. I, I, yeah. would, I, I would guess, but you know, I... You, you can always take a guess. You can always <laughs> take a guess. Yeah. But, and, and so this is like a meal now, is it? Oh, you definitely. for your lunch or... And what, what we realized is when we first introduced the cassava wrap, person just wanted to try it out to see what, what, what it was like. But seeing that we're running it for the, for the third week and this week will be the fourth week, we've realized that persons, there are a group of persons who use it for breakfast. Then there's a group who use it for lunch. Mm -hmm. And then there's also a group who use it for dinner. Mm -hmm. So we'd have people come very early in the morning to buy the cassava wrap, That's people right. who come in the afternoons, That's and right. people who come in late afternoons to take it to go home. How, how did you get started with this business? It, it all started with my mother. Right. Really, we, we, we always grow cassava. Kalbishi is a cassava growing. They always do farin. They always do cassava bread. But what really happened was one time we had some cassava planted and my mother decided on a Friday that she was going to dig some cassava and try a little cassava bread. Mm -hmm. So she went home the afternoon, probably about 30 pounds. She grated that, squeezed that, do her thing. And at the end of the exercise, I, at the time I was living in Jimmy, and she called me and told me, Glenn, you don't want to know. I just make $150. I said, mom, you doing what? She said, I just make some cassava bread and that going like, like crazy. Mm -hmm. I said, mommy, I coming up and check you tomorrow. So I went up the, the Saturday and we, 
went to the garden, we dig some more cassava and we prepared that. And as fast as we could make the cassava bread at the back of our house on two stone and a piece of copper, yeah. as fast as we could make it, that's how it was going. And then I, the idea of cassava bread hit me. Mm -hmm. And from there it was like a weekend gig. So every weekend I would go up and I would do cassava bread and go back down to look after my child and be in town. Until a cousin of mine in St. Croix, which is a very, play a very integral part in, in, in me as the cassava man, I would send cassava bread for her in St. Croix through Homing Bird. So I would do the cassava on Thursdays. I would do the cassava, like 40 cassava bread, send it up. By Friday, she called me and told me, Glenn, your money ready. Because she had already had it pre-ordered and sold. So she was selling, she was selling them in St. In St. Croix. Croix. So we did that for a while until she told me, she said, but Glenn, you, you need to find a way how you can do the cassava without the stone and the fire and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then the idea came into my mind to use a flat top grill. Mm -hmm. I know a friend of mine who had a flat top grill. I borrowed it from her and I tried it out to see how well it would work. Mm -hmm. We went to one of the events. I think it was a convention in, in London Dairy. And I get there about... about one, two o'clock the afternoon, which I thought was late. We prepared about a hundred pounds of cassava. And I say, I go and try it out. We went there and my God, I never know That's people it. could work so hard. Yeah. For like three hours steady, people coming up by cassava. When, when that day was over, in about three, four hours, I made $550. And from that day, I decided that was it. That was that was that was my so, thing. So you started off in in, in Kalibishi, Kalibishi, yes, and you branched out to. So we we've been working in Kalibishi like every other day. We would do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then we realized yo people keep coming, so we started doing it every day. Mm -hmm. But we were doing a very small amount, mm -hmm. and then a friend, another friend of mine, tell me, "But Glenn, you don't want to come into town? I have somebody I could talk to, and probably they'll let you get a little spot in town, and then you could do your thing in town." And, when I came into town, I think the, 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 first, the first day I work in town, I was like, okay, well, town is the vibes for me now. And I cannot go back to Calbishi and work in. Because we did, I went downtown with about the same, about 150 pounds of cassava process. And because I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how the people then would react to, to the product. And boy, it went, it went, it went well. Mm -hmm. So from there, we started working in town up to today. And, and as I understand it, you, you also do a special event. So someone who is having an activity, an event, uh, can engage you. And, and you come on site. Yes. Correct? We, 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 we have two event style we, we do right now, mm -hmm. where we could bring our whole production and make the actual cassava bread on site. Like we, 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 we did um, World Creole Music Festival for three years, where we did um, cassava bread inside of there. Um, we also did for individual parties where we come with the full, the full grill and everything, and we just make. We did one for um, the pork festival they have in um, where? Hotel. No, no, not the pork, the rabbit. Rabbit in um, rabbit fest. Cochrane. In Cochrane, yes. So we we also did the rabbit fest in Cochrane and a few other activities. But also what we do to, just like the what I sent to cabinet on on Tuesday, we do things like that where we prepackage the the cassava and we, we cater for mm -hmm. the, 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 the clients based on, on their needs. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Now, talk to us about the, the, the process, though, because, uh, I mean, I, I know how we made cassava bread before. I mean, you know, <laughs> we had this um, cast. Um, the kappa. You know, and you have to be in the fire, in the smoke, and so on. Um, but you have taken it to a different level. Can you share with the listening and viewing public the process? Well, I, I, I'm always a modern thinker. I always like to think ahead and how to make something better, how to make a process even quicker. And cassava was a thing. Cassava bread, it would take you two days before you could even make a cassava bread because what used to happen was we would go harvest the cassava root. You would peel it with a spoon. That At that time, you scrape, you used to scrape the, 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 the cassava root. And then you would grind it, fellas, on a, on a pump, and the, right. and the wheel turn in, and you zhu, the grease, so you grate it like that, and then you put it on a press. You put the, between a tree trunk, mm -hmm. 
and some stones and put some weight on it, put it in a bag and you squeeze it, that have to stay overnight. Mm -hmm. Now, when the first year I did festival, I was doing that, that old school method of, of preparing cassava and I realized that I ordered 700 pounds of cassava and it's like I cannot take two days to prepare the mash then to go in the venue and, and do, the, do the thing. So I had to come up with a, a way how to shorten the process. That was the first thing I, I had to figure out, how to shorten the grinding, squeezing, and getting the mash ready to make the cassava bread. And then because I had the idea of the flat top grill, then that was easy. I could take cassava anywhere, a, anywhere, at any time. So the flat top grill make it possible for me to dig a cassava root and in 30 to 40 minutes you have cassava oh. bread quick quick time so, so rather than so the you two place days, the, the rock cassava on the on the grill yes the, the cassava mash that is mash. Yeah. yeah so you mix yeah. it with coconut or whatever variety of flavor you flavor. would like and you put that on the grill and we're good to go in in five to seven minutes we have it mm -hmm. cassava ready rather than on the big Kappa that, that used to be there before, it would take you like about 10 to 15 minutes to do one cassava bread. Now, you, you do the processed products, so you add value to the cassava. Um, what are your relationships, if any, with farmers? Uh, do you have farmers who, who, uh, who you buy from, or do you, do you plant all the cassava that you, cons you have used for your business? The, the first thing, or the first thought that come to my mind was that, um, I could plant all the cassava I want and need because we had about three, 3.5 acres of land. And I decided that cassava I wanted to do. So I said, boy, I can plant my own cassava. But in planting, I realized that even if I plant 10, 15 acres of cassava, there are times I go into need farmers. So while I was waiting for my crop to get ready, I had this problem where I couldn't find the raw materials that I needed and I only used the sweet cassava, that's all I used. And at the time, most farmers or most cassava that was on island was the bitter one. Bitter. And I, for some reason, I just don't like using it because of the potential um, risk mm -hmm. that, 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 that goes with it. So I always wanted to do only sweet cassava. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I started going around the island and get farmers, take plants from me, from myself and from whoever else I knew that had sweet cassava that I was already getting from. And I started distributing cassava plants to Grand Bay, Vilcas, Dailies, even some to the Kalinago territory. I was taking plants to them. And right now I have about, I, I set up a contract with, with farmers. I, I am targeting 15 farmers where I want to have them on full-time contract with me and use my personal stock as a backup for like if anything happened between my farmers i can go to my farm and get my own so we have about 15 farmers that i'm targeting i already have five of them signed on to the contract agreeing that they will they will supply me and they 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 all around the island we have in grand bay we have in kalinago territory we have in calabishi wood fertile and vilkas mm -hmm. so we 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 we, we have a quite a good relationship I would tell you just in the past month and a half, I've been taking steadily from this one farmer and we, we're doing well and now her stock just finishing. So I'm now looking to go to the next farmer to start taking from. And weekly, how, how many pounds of cassava do you purchase from the farmers? Before COVID, we were doing 1,500 pounds, mm -hmm. but now we just getting back to the groove, so we write about 900, trying to work back up our way to the 1,000 pound awesome. level. And that's just working in town. That's just working in town. Yeah, but before COVID, we were in both Portsmouth. We were doing some in Calibishi and in Roseau, but awesome. our main spots we were working at was Portsmouth and, and oh, Roseau. No, any plans for further expansion? Oh, <laughs> well, my head is a big head. <laughs> uh, Sometimes, I was sent to China on an agro-processing um, mm -hmm. venture there and that just blew me away that everything in China is so big and if you go in, you go big or go home. So I came back home with that mentality and I, I don't want to stop just at Roseau and Portsmouth. Mm -hmm. What we're really looking to do is to dominate the cassava bread market to at some point in time to have our cassava bread readily available in the supermarkets. and. Because of the buzz that the product is making, we have quite a large number of persons living outside. 
Dominica has a lot of people mm. in Antigua. There's also a lot of people in, in St. Martin and, and the different islands, and they keep calling regularly, even in St. Croix. They, they, they're calling me constantly to, to get the product up there. So that's, that's something we're really working towards. And in, in, in the future, what, what Cassava Man really looking to do is like, oh, we have Kentucky all over the place. Mm -hmm. We could have a Cassava Man chain in the Caribbean, in the Americas, and wherever else in the world. Mm -hmm. So you're looking to export? Definitely. Um, one, one of the challenges for export right now is, you know cassava bread is. It, you bake it now and you leave it out in the open, it's going to get hard. Yeah. So what we, the technology that we, 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 we're getting into is to vacuum seal in it. Mm -hmm. The vacuum seal will keep, keep the moisture, it will keep the product as fresh as possible. And with that potential now, we could package hundreds of cassava bread and ship them out. No, as I understand it, you you would like to set up a processing plant. Yes. Uh, can you tell us more about this? Please? What what we really want to do is to get a, a full processing plant where we can manufacture as much as much mash. Mm -hmm. The cassava mash really is the root grated and squeezed. Mm -hmm. That's 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 what the cassava mash is. Now. The potential of having as much mash is, imagine you have a, a bakery and you want to do blended bread, where you use 40% of white flour and 60% of cassava mash. The amount of cassava mash that will be needed just to supply the bakeries for the blended bread. Mm -hmm. Also, if I look into increase my cassava bread and cassava wrap and products, you, you're talking a week at least 10 to 15,000 pounds of, of cassava we're looking to process. Now, where I'm processing right now at the back of my house, that's just not, it's, it's not keep, I'm not capable right now to produce that amount. So this is what really causing a little drawback and a little setback into really expanding to that mode. So what, 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 the, facility, what the facility will do, it will provide the space, it will provide the, the atmosphere and the, the, the proper... Um, the proper facility mm -hmm. to, to process as much um, cassava mash as possible. And, and so where are you with this expansion? In relation to that, before COVID, I already started um, works on getting the drawings done. I had a, a preliminary drawing done for a, a factory. I already acquired the land. We already have the land. and. What, what I really, what really slowed down the whole process is the access to financing mm -hmm. and to, to, to do the project. Because in my mind, I, I'm no, I doesn't do construction. I went to a, a contractor, I went to somebody and I said, brother, I, I know you do plans and so on. Um, can you do a joint for me? And based on that, I took it to somebody who would do, um, do my bills or quantities. I say, partner, I'm looking to do a, a project there, but I want to only spend about $60,000. And with my $60,000, I expected to do it in a container, a 40-foot container, where I would do the, the grinding, the squeezing, and the sifting of the cassava. So that, that really was the intention, to just do a little thing, a drop shed at the back, and like an office space That's on right. the other end. And when the man bring back the bill of quantities for me, the man gave me that thing at $133,000. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. We'll come to that $133,000 in a while. We have a call. Hello? Hello? Good evening. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we want... Let's get on to the phone. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. sir. Go ahead, please. Okay. The thing is... The product... The product is, the byproduct is cassava, but the name of the plant is not up. You know, so it's the best thing ever. You have the bitter mile and the sweet mile. And from that, you get cassava and powder and whatever. Sure. Okay. Okay. All right, my friend. All right. Thank you, Mr. Right. Yeah. That's my friend calling me. Thank you. <laughs> my very knowledgeable guy in plants. So, so. Um, but, but have you also thought of equity participation? If, well, um, investors what, coming in with, with, with money I, and investing in your business? I'm happy you asked that question because I just completed a training with DAIC and collaboration with the government yeah. where 
that was mainly the focus of, 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 that, of that week. And I trust me, I was happy that I always say those things come too late, but it's never too late. Mm. It's, it's knowledge that, that we need to have. And during that course, I, I learned that my business is not really a business as yet because we, I, I, I didn't have a foundation. I didn't know where to start. I didn't know how to start. I just doing my thing. I make my cassava bread. I make my money. I save. I spend. And, and that's basically it. that's it. But with that, that hub, what, what it did for me was it opened my mind as to how I can structure my business properly where I'm now able to um, access investors. So what we're doing now is that we, we already contacted a, an accountant to do our accounting and get our proper accounting. And then what we're going to do, the next move would be to re-register the business as a company. Mm -hmm. When we register the business as a company, what that will do, it will allow space now for individuals or, or venture capitals or angel, angel capital to see that this is not Glenwood serial business anymore. This is the cassava man brand. Mm -hmm. So they will now be able to, to, to tap into the business and, and, and offer investments. And would that I'll be able to, to sell shares in, in the company rather than in myself. Uh, also, what, what that would do, it would create a base for when I'm ready to even approach the bank. The bank wouldn't see Glenwood Cereal. They will see the Cassava Man brand. So kudos to the government and DAIC for, for, for making that possible for me and, and 31, 32 other um, young entrepreneurs on, on the island. Um, those, those, those opportunities help shape us they help make us and and for me right now it is shaping me and my business so we 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 looking towards that and we working towards that and in, in, in like a time a little effort we we will get a solid foundation where we could start to really go from well how how can government help you <laughs> well that's that's a real good question immediately what, what we're looking to do with what we have happening right now, we would an additional grill, a bigger grill, where we could um, make more cassava bread, especially we're looking to tap into the, um, the Antigas, the St. Martins, and those, those markets. So we're looking to get a, 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 a good grill. We're also looking to get a proper vacuum seal. And the next big thing that is really, really lingering with the cassava man is the ability to do farin. But I don't want to go into farin like how we, we do it back in the days where a man, they're weaving and sweating and doing all of that right over the pot. There are technology available right now where you just dump the machine in a pot and it will do its thing after 30, 45 minutes. You have your farin ready even more than what manpower would, would be able to do. So that's something that I really wanted to get, to get done. But COVID happened, so I had to pull that back and, and trying to see how I can, I can source it outside. How, how do you call this machine? It's a cooker. A cooker. Yeah, so we, 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 we really, and for me, I've had quite a number of customers come and say, man, you're not doing fine. I say, no, I cannot do it as yet. I cannot do it as yet. I'm not doing it as yet. And it's because I'm I waiting for that piece of equipment so I can install it and, and start producing as much firing as possible. And, and so if you get that piece of equipment, it would um, revolutionize your business? Definitely. It, it changes not just my business. It would change the, yeah. the, the cassava, um, the, the firing business in, in Dominica. Because what that would do, it would force the other um, facilities to upgrade. Mm -hmm. Because take, for instance, it would take you three days to do four to three hundred pounds of firing with that piece of equipment you take your day yeah. so what 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 that would do we could use that piece of equipment as a model to introduce to the other facilities on the island we have facilities in daily east we have facilities yeah. in the Canaanago territory yeah, you, 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 would like, you would extend that uh, definitely service. definitely and, and this piece of equipment this machine uh would now allow you to get into the farine um, and the other byproducts you mentioned. Definitely. And this would help take the, the amount to the five, seven thousand pounds. Once, 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 once that machine become, that piece of equipment become available, then the amount of raw material that's going to be needed to, to even sub, to sustain yeah. it, 
it's going to go up drast drastically. So we're looking to do like seven, seven thousand to a ten thousand pounds a pounds. week. Okay. Let us take a call and we'll come back to this point. Good. Hello, good evening, please. Yeah, good night. This is very exciting to hear. Yeah. Um, as you the faction. Well, whenever I open up the faction, the plan currently, we just had a plan. They had all the plans, but they need to get all the plans for the power of our people from the party. That's one point. Um, another one that was one, if you never been um, collaborating with the, with the guys um, who, who do the, the, the traditional uh, um, the traditional um, uh, bakery in because the, the French people in what they call it the Vienna crowd they come up from soda so now in the cold they need to what is right they tell you and that that would be a fantastic market for the day because they need to come up with the day another one to the about is the day the travel is excellent for for diabetics so that's a low glycemic like thing so you could promote that as a, 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 a diabetic food. You see? Yeah. Um, even things like that, they say it's pizza, etc. When you have a, a, a pizza, they say it's 10 percent um, cassava and the rest of the But then diabetic food is not too much, a lot, a lot um, safer than, than the pure. Um, so, uh, well, um, uh, pizza, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You call us talking um, about uh, the pizza dough, etc. Et that's 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 one of the, the, the fantastic thing about, about cassava right now. The the skin that I am using to do the wrap, that skin could also be used for making pizza. I've had customers already come to me and tell me all I want is just a, just a skin, a base for 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 me to make a pizza. So what we're mm -hmm. looking into and what we're going to do eventually is do prepackaged skins, package it nice, and then we can have those on the shelves in the supermarket like tomorrow once we get the packaging materials set up for them and the proper equipment so we can mass produce. We'll be able to make the skins and make it available to the public. The skins could come in, in different flavors. <clears throat> right now, just how I could do the cassava wrap with with a ginger skin, with a banana skin, with a, uh, just name it. We, we, we could do different skins for, for, for different purposes. Well, well, I asked you a question about how you think government could assist you. Uh, you have pointed out to me uh, what your plans are and uh, hinted the areas you believe the government could assist. What I would like for the government to also do is to sit down with you um, to see where do we have facilities, a, a facility a building that we can retrofit, you know, to to get it to start, and we could we could have this uh, lease to you on a dollar a year, you know, and that's what we look at it. But what we'll do, um, you you you're a young man, you're very talented. Um, this is the kind of uh, this is the kind of investments we want in the country to our young people to get involved in, uh, using our raw material, um, engaging the farmers. Um, and creating jobs and, and oh, yeah. wealth for yourself and your family. And, and if we can add value to our primary crops, uh, we can certainly uh, create jobs in this country. And, and so I, I believe what you're doing needs to be uh, promoted. Uh, we need to continue to support you. Uh, we will sit down between yourself and the government to look at the proposal that you have for the expansion and improvement of your facilities. But I will make an initial commitment on behalf of the government to provide you with this um, cooker um, that you that you, you have to desperately need to to get you to 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 roll, as we say, uh, yeah. <laughs> much much faster. Uh, so I'm making a commitment to you for this uh, cooker. Um, we will we will we will talk to you tomorrow or Tuesday so we can get details on this, so so we can go forward and so on. Wonderful. Yeah. So that, that's our offer to you. Um, in, in the, in the, in the, I'm, I'm, I'm very keen on, on seeing you expand to the point where we can export and we can have a factory and uh, we can have more people employed and uh, uh, so, so this, is, this is great and 
and the, the number of young people like yourselves who are involved in this kind of enterprise. And I think with a, with, with a little push um, in a meaningful way, I, I believe we can, we can get there. Not the 2,000 or 5,000 <sighs> um, grants from small business, you know, to get, identify, you know, 25, 30 people like yourself and, and just push you forward. So this is our commitment to you with regards to the cooker. My understanding is that the cooker is about what? Uh, 35,000 um, EC dollars. And so that's our commitment to you. Any um, other bit of advice you have for me as Prime Minister of the country? Oh, um, yeah. where, um, and also a words to our young people out there. And well, of course, I, we, we could go until tomorrow, tomorrow talking. To, to. But first thing is, there are a lot of times that institutions, government, for, for a matter of fact, seek to, 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 so, to show support to individuals. They, they put programs in place. They, they, they make moves to try to help. But often, after that help is given, those individuals are forgotten. That happened to me several times where we, we, we make moves, we, we get involved in things, and then all of a sudden you watch around and it's you alone that really there in your boat. Mm -hmm. You have to row your own canoe. So what I think government need to do is whichever um, entrepreneur, whichever business that, that they, they choose to invest in, they should see to it that the investment itself don't go to waste, that they continue yeah, following follow, up follow, follow and, and keep giving advice and, and keep, yeah. like, hold my hand. I don't want you to yeah. just come give me $35,000 or give me a piece of equipment and leave me alone. Chances are, and we see it happen every day where government go and put in into somebody or into a business and after two days you're asking about where that money gone yeah. or what, what, what has government done. So I think. So, so you say that the government should enter into some kind of written agreement uh, with, condi with conditionalities, con yes, with certain and goals to be met. And yeah, and don't don't just leave us out there after yeah. you you because it, it's, it's a numbers thing. Government can say, "Oh, I have helped 100, 100 um, um, businesses," but when you really look at the hundred businesses, sometimes you're not seeing how anything. Many are, how many of them are still going? Exactly. That's so true. so you you government need to hold hold our hands and and see us through. And the other thing again is, it don't have to be the cassava man. For me, government can pick one, one viable business a year or every five years or every two years, whichever they feel deemed to, and, and just make that business into a big business rather than trying to do 15, 20, right. 30 businesses. All right. So, so, you, so I'm starting with you tonight. Great. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm starting with you tonight. Good. All right, today, we'll start with you today and, and we'll move forward with this. But certainly, we'll need to engage ourselves more with the Minister for Small Business and Definitely. Minister of Trade and Agriculture. And I think so that we can hear from, from practitioners like yourself who are involved. I agree. You know, people talk out there, but they're not practitioners. And That's you, you're, it. You're in the business, you're in the kitchen, you know mm -hmm. how, how the food is being cooked, and you can advise us on, on the ingredients that you're putting in, in, in this food so better able to, Definitely. to assist you going forward. And so, we, I am. Personally, I am I am very excited about this. I, I planned a little bit of cassava. I, 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 I always have got cassava, but but for my consumption purposes, I, I like cassava. I cook it just like dash, you know, or, or yeah, yes. and so on. Um, and, and there's no um, ground provision that's 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 um, better than a, a cassava. I believe that. And I you, agree. When you have the Madam Speaker is here later on, and when you have the chicken gravy and so on, <laughs> and then you crush it in it and so on, you eat this and so on. Okay, yeah. but but thank you, Casava man. Thanks um, for making the time. I really appreciate it. You're having this conversation with you. Um, I look forward to your um, further growth and development. The, the country needs people like yourself, positive people, because we all can sit back and, and complain and criticize. But you know, it, and that's very easy to do. Uh, we only need to to put our hands to the to the plow and to to work and and let us help each other um, develop because. The, the, the more successful you get, it's better for Calibishi, it's better for Dominica, Trust me. Uh, it's better for the economy, and we all benefit um, from your I, success. I, I must say thank you very much, PM, for having mm -hmm. me on, on the program this evening. Mm -hmm. All my friends and family outside watching and mm -hmm. looking on, I bet they, they, they're feeling good mm -hmm. that, that we're making moves. But also, it takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of dedication. 
And I don't believe the cassava man would be there if I wasn't doing something good enough or trying to make an impact on, on, on society. And if it's one thing somebody out there or any young person or any business person can take out of me being here is that it takes a lot of work and dedication for you to be successful in anything. If it's stone you move in, you'll be the best stone mover out there. I must say you have a good attitude towards work. Um, you have to. You know, um, I know your mom very well, hardworking lady. Very. You know, very, very hardworking lady. Very. You know, um, Superstar. Very hardworking. And of course, you are the personality. You, you have good customer relations, and that, that's they important try. in the business. Side. People have to feel uh, welcome. People have to feel excited coming to your business. And okay. uh, I, I know people do feel that way. But have a wonderful evening. I Thank wish you all the best. Happy Independence to you. And of course, Thank to you. your family in Calibishi and all the wonderful people in Calibishi. Um, I'm hoping to come back to Calibishi soon. No problem. So, Anytime. So village I love very much. I have lots of Anytime. friends and family there. Um, wonderful people there. Thank you very much. Thank Michelle, you very much. Take a you. break and we'll come back uh, with my friend, uh, Honorable Alex Boyd Knights. Thank you. Thank you. So here I have my fish, which I put into fillets, four fillets. And I have put it in a brine of salt, lime, and water. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just washing the pieces over to make sure that I get rid of all the brine. I've cleaned out the fish, and I've got it all ready for me to add my seasoning. So here I have my washed fish, and I'm going to season it. Put a little bit of lime, a little bit of salt. I just love this sound of the cracking of the freshly rubbed black pepper. Some thyme. I'm going to put a little bit of side and I'm going to put my garlic as well. Just a little bit of parsley and I'm going to I'm washing it. And I'm going to add something which most people don't know is what the real Creole people use. That's my clove essence. So now I'm going to get ready to cook. I'm putting in some oil, not very much. So as it starts to bubble, I'm going to add my onions which I've sliced and I'm also going to add some tomatoes which I chopped. Not a very high fire, you actually have to use a low fire. You have to make sure that all the tomato juice dries up by the time you put your fish in. And at this stage, what I'm going to do is open up so that I can put in my seasoning. So I've turned up the heat and I'm going to put in the seasoning peppers now. And then you cover the pot very tightly. And that's called touffe. You touffe it and it makes its own water. Okay, I'm going to open the pot and just turn over the pieces. And when you've turned all the pieces, to put it back to cook for a few more minutes. The last two things we're going to add is the hot pepper, the hot water, and some thickening, which is just two, three teaspoons of flour in a container with a little bit of water, and you mix it and you add it to it to give it a thickness. And that's it. So there you have it, your couillon poisson. Okay, welcome back. I am joined now by Speaker Emerita, Honorable Alex Boyd Knight. Uh, she joins us to speak of Dominica's traditional cuisine. Um, Madam Speaker, lovely seeing you. Um, all decked up in Creole independence season. Uh, welcome. How are things? How are you? I'm doing much better, thank you. I haven't been well for a few weeks, but I'm getting there, yeah. I think. How are your white ginger lilies? Your oh, I still have a lot. I, I still have some for sale. I put in some more, so I, I have a few for sale. And jacarandas. As well. Oh, the jacarandas are going very well. I'm getting even offers from overseas. Overseas. Mm -hmm. You know, Madam Speaker has a wide variety of plants. Um, you mm -hmm. know, um, rare ones. Rare, rare ones. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got some from Africa and where else? Um, really, most of them come from. Dominica around Dominica. that people don't really take care of or recognize and I sort of I like to think of colonizing them I take them from the forest and I bring them yeah. and I put them in my yard and when people come they say hey, but that's nice I say, that's well nice. it's available in the forest people are not aware that Dominica has the biggest selection of, of, of wild begonias mm -hmm. probably if not in the Caribbean probably certainly in the Western Hemisphere we have loads of wild begonias mm -hmm. And I have a lot of them in my yard. A lot of them. Now, you are better known as a lawyer. You are one of the attorney um, and also speaker of the, of the House, the longest serving speaker of the House of Assembly. 
you you have been a, a, a women's rights activist uh, yes. for all of your life. Um, when you speak about women's rights, you know you you must mention um, Alex Boy Knights. Oh my um, but 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 um, <coughs> but for those who who know you very well, like myself, you are an exceptional cook. I mean, you may be one of the best uh, cooks we have in Dominica. How how did you um, get the skills though? Mainly from my mother. Mm-hmm. My mother was a well-known cook in Dominica mm-hmm. years ago. And um, she led the way in, in, in doing a lot of stuff. She was very creative in her inventions and so on. So she put a spin on a lot of things that people did traditionally. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sort of give it a, 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 a professional touch so that, you know, that she, she did her catering. I'll tell you one of them. Um, she, she made something she called sauce picks, where um, she boiled the sauce, the, 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 the trotters and the, 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 the hock, and she'd mince it and season it very highly and gelatinize it, you know, using all the gelatinous stuff, boiling it down till it got really gelatinous, put it in a, a square pan, put it to chill, cut it in squares and, squares and serve it with a cucumber dip. So that was a sauce. Everybody knows sauce, but then you get a sauce pick when you come to a cocktail party and you feel sort of, you know, you're having something all but new. Okay. Now, we know independ- we're now in independence season. Um, yes. Have you started making your famous crab acts? Eh? Not yet, because um, by the time they opened the season and I got to know about it, um, the sun had come out and we were in our TKRM. Yeah. And TKRM means Pani Quab. Pani Quab. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm getting off you. The last couple of days of rain is ensuring that I will have some crabs so that I, by later on in the week, I should have some crab backs. You, you, you've been advising the government on this um, hunting season, and, and you believe that we have the calendar wrong. Yes. Can you tell, can you tell the public about this? I would love to, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I kept wondering why we are having this closed season for crabs and what motivated the f- powers that be within the forestry division to come and decide that this is the, cr- the time when crabs are multiplying, so therefore they have to close the season. In fact, you know what I found out? It was just a lazy man's job. They lumped all the different creatures into one season and they decided that, look, we're closing the season for one time. Actually, it should be differently. It should be birds one season because they don't... They don't um, um, set at the same time mm. to crapo, to crabs, to aguti. They all have their special um, seasons when they have their young ones, which is what you're trying to protect. But I guess it makes it easier if you just close this and say, okay, fellas, you all can have nothing. Eh? Don't take anything. Leave it alone. And it's easier for them. Yeah. But is it serving the purpose of a closed and an open season? Is it serving that purpose? I doubt it. But with the crabs in particular, when I pestered um, the then minister at the time to tell me why you all were having this crab season closing at that time, he told me they got a lot of information from South America. Brazil have crabs like ours. Mm. And the Brazil close, close season was from January to September. Mm-hmm. I said, but you know something? Brazil is in the Southern Hemisphere. You know, we should be doing the opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, and then people started thinking. <clears throat> so I maintain that um, we are not really paying attention to the really spawning of these various mm-hmm. things. Even the fishes, they mm-hmm. don't all need the same season. So that is probably what you all should get some experts to look at. So we can, because <clears throat> everybody is familiar with driving along the West Coast during rainy season, May, June, July, and you're killing crabs, black is white, when they should be going in somebody's pot. So I, I think we should reopen that, that um, conversation. I think so. With the forest people. I think so, Why definitely. Like I'd love so. to thank you. So what are your other specialties? Are you, <clears throat> First of all, let me make a little correction. Yeah. I lo- uh, maybe people would not be happy about it, but I like to make it. I'm a cook who practices law. You're a cook? Okay. okay. So I, I, I got it correct now. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So what are the other specialties that you, you're working on? Um, in lines of cooking, you cooking, mean? Yeah. Well, um, it's been a little while now. Actually, in 1967, 
Dr. Liverpool came to St. Lucia. He, they were doing some laws business. Mm. And he told me, Alex, have you started writing that cookery book yet? I told him, I'm really thinking about it. And I thought about it, and I thought about it. I'm still thinking about it, but it's getting closer because my children have decided, Mommy, this is nonsense now. You have all the material. This research that you just did give you a start. We are going to take over. Because, in fact, I taught cookery. I had my own cooking school in St. Lucia for about 15, 16 years. And during that time, I developed my own recipes. I was able to write them and view how my various students over the years interpreted what I wrote. So I was able to hone a recipe into a position where when you read that recipe, even if you have no prior knowledge of cooking, mm. you will be guided through by the, the method to be able to produce the dish that you know, somebody else who has all the cooking experience can do. So that, that was my motivation. So. And so I have all these recipes. Few hundreds, and I have specific recipes. For example, I have developed 54 recipes for breadfruit. Mm. The main part, I mean, I hear people now talking about making breadfruit pizza. I was making breadfruit pizza in the 1970s out of this special dough that I had um, developed with breadfruit. Mm -hmm. So you had this special dough, you could make breadfruit pizza with it, you could make breadfruit bake, which you just put a little bit of cheese on because before we knew pizza, we knew other things. Breadfruit donuts, breadfruit biscuits, and different things, a bread, breadfruit coconut bake that was quite nice. And you know, so I, <clears throat> I have, as I say, about 54 of these recipes that I developed, tried and true. Yeah, excellent. Now, you make a, a, a main broth. I mean, I say broth, but people say broth. Broth. Um, mm. And, and Dominicans generally are, are big fans of, of, of broth. Well, what are the tips you have though, for, for persons who, who like to have There's a, somebody a, a here who broth. knows and remembers me doing it on cooking classes. Yeah. My mother taught us, and that's what the older people did. When you finish making your broth, most people put into a broth what they want. Because mm -hmm. some people put fish and salt meat. Mm -hmm. Some people just put fish alone. It depends on, you know, what they like. So after you've made your broth and you've got it nice and tasty and using fresh seasonings, nothing from, the only thing you should take from a bottle is the salt. Salt. Okay? Salt. Having done that, what my mom would do, she would cut up some onion and say really small, then she'd put some parsley in it, then she'd put some lime and garlic, and she'd mix it with a little oil, and she'd add it to the cooked broth. And that gives it a nice little mm -hmm. taste putting it a notch above the ordinary broth. Mm -hmm. That was her slant. So, so you use, you recommend that you use <coughs> fresh seasoning? Of course. Uh, I grow seasoning in my garden. I have yeah. everything I need. No, no. some people put in chicken soup. Like the um, Maggi. Not, oh no. Yeah. I, I, I was told about uh, That's an offense. Chicken. Yeah, it, it is. That's an I, offense I, I, against the I feel the offended palate. by it, that's right. Yes, that's an offense. And I uh, think so. Yeah. And I don't like carrots in, in, in broth either. Well, it's my sweet. broth, I like... I like my, my, I put my okros yeah. and Christophine and, yeah. and, and cabbage. Yeah. cabbage yeah. I start and off cabbage. with the cabbage leaves at the bottom. I yeah. put all the cabbage, shred it at the bottom. Right. I put my provisions. If I'm making fish broth, the last thing I put is the fish. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, fi right. the fish goes in like 10 minutes before you shut off the so, pot. So we do, I, I, I do similar to Yes, we were probably taught by the same person <laughs> somewhere along the line. No, no you also, you also <coughs> do a, a very good kubuyon au poisson. Yes, the kubuyon fish, yes. Kubuyon fish, yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you go about doing this? Okay, well, you can use, I personally prefer to use either dolphin, kingfish, mm -hmm. young kingfish, kingfish or yeah. tuna. Some people seem to think that tuna makes the best I, I don't like kubuyo, tuna. but some people don't like, but I'll tell you. The trick about if you're making kubuyon with tuna, it must go fresh from the sea to you. Do not put it in the, in the freezer. freezer. Once you put it in the freezer, it's going to be a little dry. Yeah. But if you get it fresh and, you know, you have all your seasonings available, it's pretty good. So you got your fish. Um, in the case of tuna, okay, you don't like tuna, so let's do dolphin. My family do not want to see skin. They don't want to see bone. So I've got to... Fillet the fish and cut it nice. You're not bound to do all that. Some people love their bone and their skin. To each his own. You put, anyway, you cut your fish in nice bite size. Well, I would say about, I usually say two inches by about three inches is just about right and about an inch thick. 
So you put that in your pan as, as I am um, this or anything. I put it in a brine first of all of water, salt, and lime. Yes, ma'am. Now you wash your fish, in the, you leave it soaking, and then you wash it out, and you make your nose act for you, you smell it. If it's still smelling that fresh way, put it in another set of lime and salt and water. Then you can leave it there while you prepare your seasonings. I use a lot of garlic, sive, thyme, seasoning pepper, and something most people don't use in their fish, but I do, and that's clove. Okay. Now yeah, let me you, stop you here to clove, tell yeah. them, clove, you just, I make clove essence. Yeah. I simply get a little jar that had in mayonnaise or something, fill it with fresh dry cloves, add rum, and two days later or three days later you have clove essence. And as, it, as you keep using it and it dries up, you keep adding um, more rum to it so that you know you always have this clove essence. So I put my clove and I give it a good shake. And you can do, when you actually wash the lime out for the second time or first time if you don't do it the second time, I do not cut up my seasonings. My thing is to just put the seasonings together do as if you're washing them, the, the sieve and the parsley and the thing. And, you know, like just to break it up so the, the, fla the seasoning flavor comes out, I put it in my pan, I toss the pan about and whatever, and then I leave that there while I then now cut up my onion. I slice my onion and I cut up my tomatoes. And I, I used to be getting this nice cooking butter from Gordlu, but since they don't they, you don't, they, no, you can't get it now. Yeah, you know. So, but I would use that. Um, it used to be very yellow. Yes. Yeah, this one over here in Dominica. Red, it's, reddish. It's, it's I get it straight from Guadeloupe, but, Guadalupe. you know, we, do, yeah. we, 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 we have closed that yeah. door, so we yeah. can't get it. But so I use mellow cream, but the mellow cream has a taste, so I don't really use yeah. much of it. And if you can afford it, table butter is also good. Mm. Okay, so I put the oil, the butter, I put in the onion and the tomatoes. The thing about it is that you must make sure that the tomato liquid dries up before you add your fish. And when you add the fish, you add it in one layer and you cover it down to two feet. Mm -hmm. And it makes its own water. Mm -hmm. You open the pan briefly after about five minutes, turn all the pieces over, you know, on the other side. And then you cover it again. You boil some water. Make sure you have boiling water there. And your APC, which is your flour, flour. and your mm -hmm. um, thing, and then your hot pepper, if you're going to use it, you'll put it then. And then, so you open the pot because the back the pieces that uh, you've turned are uh, okay. They've been in, soaking in the, the, the liquid. You add your water, you add your APC, you put in your hot pepper, and you can put some chopped parsley then, and then you cover it down and let it cook for about three minutes. The name is coup bouillon, which is cool. a short boil. Yeah. Coup bouillon not supposed to take more than 15, 20 minutes to do, 20 minutes yeah. maximum. And, and, and so in the absence of the orange butter, Mm -hmm. you, the tomato, you, the yeah, tomato. You, you use um, some curry? Never, no, never, never. Curry. Never, I've never. I put curry in my brown stew. Brown stew. When I fry chicken, sorry, not chicken, fish, I always put a little bit of curry powder in the flour. The flour. Okay. That is when I'll use you, curry you fry, powder. When you fry the fish? Yes, when I fry the fish, I put that in yeah. it. Now, we have a very rich uh, uh, and varied history in Dominica. We have the Kalinago, we have the Africans, we have the French, we have the British. Uh, how have these cultures influenced our um, cuisine here in Dominica? Okay, if I may do it chronologically, mm -hmm. we had the Kalinago here, the, then they were called the Caribs. But then came the slaves. Mm -hmm. Interestingly though, the slaves um, had the same sort of um, vegetables, when I say vegetables, pro ground provisions, I should say, as the carrots, because they had sweet potato, they had yams, and they had taro, but, well, which is uh, something like dashing. So they, they had all these things, and so what they did, though, ingeniously, the, carib um, the, the cali um, African women, when they came over, they made necklaces, which I suppose the, 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 the peace people who were running those slave ships, didn't attribute to anything specifically. But they, they, they wove their seeds, their okra seeds and all their different things, their seeds into that. And when they got a chance, when they came over, those who lived and had it there, they, they planted that, so they had that. Then came the fact that they 
eventually came with the Kalinago. The Kalinagos did not really, the, the, the slaves were more in touch with the um, Europeans than the Kalinago were for obvious reasons. But then there came a time when the slaves, now free, or now escaping and getting into with the Carib, then learning something new about how to live in the land that they know they've now arrived in. Mm -hmm. And so the Caribs um, were great fishermen, great hunters and so, but Caribs never cooked their food very much. You see, they just roasted what That's they right. did. But then the Africans now were, were doing more cooking at that point in time. Uh, they, and another thing is they both used um, mortar and pestle. Bo so um, there was a lot of marriage that when, if you look at the history, the, a lot of things are not dissimilar, okay, from these original. They all came together, and then, you know, the slaves taught, um, the, 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 those slaves who were cooks in the home of the Europeans, they learned the European way of doing things and made a nice marriage of it, they, and they brought that home, obviously, to the others, and so we ended up with this lovely melting pot of what is the, uh, distinctive Dominican cuisine. An interesting development, though, took place, I think, when um, the slaves who were free, they became, I mean, owners of land and of their own means. By that time, the French had come in. They, yes, they were used to making their one-pot things, but then they were introduced to a different type of soup which those who were living in, you know, the middle class and upper class lives indulged in, and they made these soups that were first course because they were getting to be like the people that they worked for. So a lot of developments across cultures and things took place. From the British, we got all of these lovely puddings that we, 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 we make. The British also brought their way of roasting and stuffing as a, as a means of, of cooking you know, and um, the, cust the use of custards and, and so on. The French were the ones that really brought the seasonings and, and the, the, the French used a lot of alcohol in their cookery wines and so. So in all, we ended up with something, you know, that is pleasant or was pleasant, but I'm afraid we're losing it to, to, to macaroni. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how much of, you know, how much of these um, traditions we have carried um, through up until today? Quite a bit, you know, really. Well, the cassava, mm -hmm. we, we use it a lot, the farine. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we, we, people do it, but it's mostly a Spanish thing, which they got from the Amerindians, so it, it seem, it's a, a, a still there, is cooking food in, in, in banana or breadfruit, um, not banana, banana leaves, yes, and then they would also use corn to put yeah. things in to cook. Yeah. So they'd make things and put it that way. We don't do that much anymore. I mean, certain mm -hmm. people depend on their... Uh, for when Christmas reached, some people, especially those with Trinidad ties, like their pastels, mm -hmm. you know? But we used to be able to make, long ago, you'd, you'd, you'd have pemi which is cornbread, and then, you know, we don't really have that. People don't do these things anymore, mainly because they are time-consuming. Mm -hmm. And so this is the very same reason why they rather use macaroon than piladashin, mm -hmm. not realizing that there's something about our provisions that are life-giving and, 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 and contribute to our longevity, mm -hmm. you know? No. no. How do you go about... Um Making your browning for meats. Do you well, use sugar? N sometimes, sometimes, but originally the browning was done. Mm -hmm. People bought their meat on a Saturday, eh? and mm -hmm. in our neighborhood you could smell Saturday night, everybody yeah. was oozing their meat outside mm -hmm. on coals. Mm -hmm. And you would see the meat, it was a sort of a, a braising te technique they used. You, you will see the meat, you add a little bit of water, you will see some more. But ve very, very few people had in that era used anything like sugar. Mm. If you want to use sugar, I recommend that you, when you put in your oil, you can put, let's say, a pot spoon of sugar to cook about three pounds of meat. Mm -hmm. 
and then when, you know you put it the sugar in when the oil is really really hot, hot yeah. over deep fire you put in the sugar and immediately put your your meat in it the sugar is not browning but it will add to the browning process of the meat because the sugar is there i see i see and some people use soya sauce as well to get the, the browning happening okay. How do, you, how do you account for the differences in styles of cooking between the rural part of Dominica and the urban part? Um, well, that is because of what they were accustomed to and, and what, they, mm. the, 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 what they had at their disposal. Okay, I see. What they had at their disposal, basically. And one of the things that I found out, which really surprised me, was that until about the early 1950s, most villagers did not have bread mainly because they didn't have ovens and so on, uh, you know? And, and so it was only, let's say, in the, just after the war that people really started using what they call farwin fuss and, and, and were introduced to bread. But we made rose bakes, so. though. Pardon? We, we made rose bakes. R right, yes. <laughs> but they, they, they used more of the local flour that flour. they made from the, the planting Plant. and the breadfruit and so, I rather see. than the farwin fuss. Farwin fuss. Uh, we have a call, Madam Speaker. Uh, Carla, please, good evening. Yes, good evening, Prime Minister. Good evening. Good yes. evening. Uh, welcome. Please. And also good evening, Speaker Enrico. Uh, Speaker, I want to congratulate you. And first of all, I, I want your permission to take a photograph of that dress you have on you. <laughs> uh, but Speaker, uh, have you ever thought of, of having a book? Uh, let's say a book to do with cooking. Uh, and also, I love your culinary art. I would, I would suggest that uh, you should have a little school at least every three months, you can get 10 students to learn to cook, because I want to learn to cook. I love this sort of culinary arts, and certainly, you are tired tonight, you know, you're well adorned, and I want your permission to take a picture while you're on the seat. I'm listening tonight. Thank you. Um, um, I'll just tell you, when I came back to Dominica um, in 1990, um, I did cooking classes for about two years. And it really was a strain on me because of my, my, my commitment to my legal practice that was just starting off and taking off. So then I started doing the cooking classes on TV. Um, yeah, I remember this. I, I yeah. did that for a few I years. Remember, I remember the famous uh, stuff wings. Stuffed chicken legs. 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 I showed, you all, I showed how I, to I, bone I, the legs and stuff them. And stuff I, I remember right. very well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of, I, um, it was interesting, though, where I started doing the classes. I shall tell you later you, you tell me later. <laughs> I, I, I suspect I know. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, during the lecture at, at, uh, at the UE Open Campus, mm -hmm. uh, at the start of this History Week on, on traditional cuisine, you referenced the, the changes brought about by, by the Second World War. Um, can, well, can you tell us about this? It, um, well, okay. And, you know, it was something I was speaking to your, your, your team about yesterday. And I was referencing it to our COVID situation. I, I, I want to say this first. When, while the war was going on, people were so busy dealing with the war issues that they, they, they didn't think about anything more than coping with what was in front of them. It was quite a shock to the world that the for at least four or five years after that war. Okay, so that was, we're talking about 46, 47, 48, 49, up to 1950, that things were scarce, commodities were scarce, and that was a really a, 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 a worse part than the war itself. And that was, I was saying so to the young people, I was telling them, look, if you all think 2020 is bad, 2021, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guaranteeing you is going to be worse. Mm. Because it, when I think of what happened to the war, after the war and the aftermath of the war, the scarceness of food and all these things that were happening, it might well be the same. I, 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 I believe it is not. But to come back to your question was this. Um, yes, it was very tough for the first four years after the war. And of course, a lot of changes took place. The same fire in France we were just speaking about was not available. So not only were the country people utilizing the flour made from all our starches, but the town people started doing it too. And they developed all these puddings like the, the cassava pudding, the, 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 the sweet potato pudding and all these things, which they made so nice that they remained with us up to today. A lot of the things that were done because of the scarcity that existed after the war. But really what um, came about as the biggest change in our 
I would say food customs came about when we got electricity in 1949. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, people may not know it, but for many years, you only had electricity at night, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., and in Roseau and environs. And the only day you had electricity during the day was on a Thursday when the hospital was having its operations done. Then in 1949, the British, I guess, their conscience or whatever, decided that they're going to send, it was called Commonwealth Development Corporation, into the islands. And they um, introduced the, the, the turbines and all the things that gave Dominicans electricity all day and all night. So that for the first time we had electricity, you have your electricity so therefore you can keep frozen things so that most people in Roseau environs everywhere, most every day you ate fish. Mm -hmm. That was what you ate in the week. You saved the little chicken that you had for Sunday and so on. But then when there was electricity and so people could, um, they, they could order um, surplus chicken from America and so on, and beef. The diets changed. People started eating chicken during the week. People started eating beef during the week. And so the whole dietary structure changed. You, you, you find people were in eating more protein and, protein and yes, things just changed from then, yeah. you know? What, are the, what, what useful traditions do you think we have lost over? The ability to peel and eat a dash gin. <laughs> to peel green banana. Let me tell you, I watched some youngsters peeling green banana. If I, boy, I should have just gone and gotten my camera, this thing would have gone viral. Mm -hmm. See people fighting to peel um, fig and saying, man, let's just put the thing to boil with the skin and that's all, <laughs> you know? That we have, we, I think we have got so disaccustomed to things that we deem inconvenient and we look for shortcuts. So most people, they will tell you they eat pasta. There's something people eat a lot of. Um, I've never really eaten it, but I've seen students eat it a lot. Ramen. Ramen. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, that, that is taking the place of boiling a few fig. That's so nutritious. Mm. You know, uh, I, we've, we've lost that. We've lost to um, people's taste buds have gone awry because the fear that pe people have uh, available to them on a daily basis in the different cook shops. I don't know if you counted how many restaurants on King George Fifth Street alone. Mm -hmm. Somebody should do that. Go and tell me how many restaurants. They must have at least 200 place, eating places in Roseau alone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people are buying food. But they're not discriminating. And it, they're only not discriminating is because they're lazy. They're, so, they're more interested in eating out than eating something nice. So we are losing a, a generation whose taste buds have gone all right. I don't know if you, I don't yeah. know. And then we use more, more imported seasonings. Imported season, seasonings and all these things. They're like, always like using Cezor powder. And, and Why? I have, right now I have basil, mm. um, sage, um, parsley, thyme, celery, mm. chad or benny, but I don't really use it much. I also have um, um, rosemary. rosemary that is available to me, yours for the picking in my yard. And I keep a little bit upstairs. So if I don't want to go you downstairs, go I have my yeah. supply upstairs. We have a call, please. Hello, caller. Good evening. Hello, good evening. Good evening, Mrs. Uh, tonight. Yes, good yeah. evening. And good evening, Diane. Yeah, good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. I'd like to ask you where Toton Pile came from. Is it uh, Carinago or the Black? Toton Pile. Thank you. Uh, taught, well, you see, Africans pounded food in, in mortars with pestles. The Caribs also did it, but I think they, did, they didn't do the food itself. I think they were doing more of the things that they wanted to process. Now, we do, the Caribs here may not do it, but I have been made to understand that there is a, um, the same casrip that you can get in Guyana, which preserves meats and so. There was something that preserved meats in Dominica long, long ago in the 20s and 30s. I tried to find out, but nobody seems to know much about it. But there was some, th and, and that thing was a derivative again of the mayok. Let's please somebody tonight. Yeah, mayok. <laughs> now, now, do you believe our, our eating and cooking habits are contributing to the high incidence of chronic non-communicable diseases? Oh, yes. 
people look at my size and they think I'm eating badly, but they don't know the, my, my, my problem is my sugar. Yeah, I love you, sweet. You love and <laughs> I'm not diabetic. I'm not diabetic. And um, I've been told by um, sp um, specialists that people seem to think that if you eat a lot of sugar, you will become a diabetic. I'm told if you're not predisposed to being a diabetic, you won't be. Mm. So I feel a little smug and secure mm. that I can eat my sugar in peace. It will tell on my hips, but my palate enjoys it. <laughs> oh, so, so how, do we, how do we arrest the situation though? Okay, we arrested by, I think, giving cooking classes to those cook shops mm. and letting them know it's possible to do tasty food quickly. Mm -hmm. Some of them are quite good. But for some reason, those that I find that little out of the way places that cook really nice food, they're not known. I, I don't really want to, to think, but there's a particular place I know that the food is really good. I mean, they, they, they do some nice baked wings, better than the places that you think, well, they, they have a name and you go there, mm -hmm. you know? So I think we, the clientele, the customers, are the ones who have to let the persons who are preparing the food know that, look, we want better. Do not blacken our pillow to the extent that you do. I don't know what's it with black pillow and, and, and black noodles. You go to buy chow mein and, and, and it's not soy sauce they use it, I promise you. Because it would be too salty. Yeah. The amount of soy sauce to get that dark black, would, it, it, it would be too salty, you wouldn't be able to eat it. Yeah, it's wrong, eh? mm -hmm. yeah. Of course. Yeah, phone call, please. Hello? Hi, good evening to you. Good evening. Um, I have a question. Um, I am a student, uh, I'm going to college, and I just got it from my school, from me. And over the past 10 my friends have been asking for help with electricity because why is there any electricity? Right. Yeah, I would, um, I would suggest so, I, I would suggest you reach out to your member of parliament, your power rep, and speak to your power rep on, on this matter. Okay? Yeah, yeah, I would, yeah, please go to the parliament's office and, and you can make an appointment to see the power rep to talk about this matter, about this local stuff. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but, but how do we, 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 we need to pass on this, um, these traditions? Because I agree. And that is why one of the things that I like most about Saturdays mm -hmm. is that everybody in every place is making the, the traditional foods. Mm -hmm. Everybody has fish broth, they have um, um, tripe stew, they have black pudding, they have sauce, they also have the um, bullfoot soup and all these things. And so I, I consider Saturdays almost to be a, 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 a mini creole day. And that's good, okay? It's just that I think the, the, the proprietors of these establishments, they can um, think more about taste than doing the thing quickly. They, they do the salt fish and green fig. Won't you? Buy one seasoning pepper to put in it now. Okay. One, they're not going to break the bank? No, no. Crab is, a, is a very is very popular in America. Yes. Uh, what are the tips you have for, for persons who would like to prepare it and partake in it? What about the forestry? No tips there? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the thing about crab backs is that you have to get the crab meat. Okay? No, that is the difficulty. Um, people who make crab backs for themselves, they pick the crabs. And according to how they pick it, they can get the, as much meat as possible. There's a specific way that I learned, I was taught to pick crabs, that I can get the maximum crab meat out of it. Mm -hmm. Having um, gotten your crab meat, you, you then, uh, the recipe is available. Uh, what I do, I, I cut up my onion and my sieve. I have my garlic 
I have my parsley, my thyme, my, I, oh, I prepare all my seasonings, but I use a, a, a food processor. So what I do is I put the garlic first in the food processor, then the onion. I put my oil, I put my, my garlic and my onion on low fire, and I saute it until it's nicely um, translucent. Mm. And then I will add my crab meat, which I've passed in the blender. Okay, and then I put that in and I do it and then I make a mixture of my seasoning peppers that I've deceded, my hot pepper, my thyme, my parsley, and I put that in. And then one of the things that I add, which most people don't add, well, of course, you put in your bread at that stage as well. And then most people don't do it, but I use um, some Leon Perrin sauce. I use a little bit of ketchup. And then I also use some rum mm. okay and that, that uh, you know I, I have the recipe the we I, I think have it on their web, website I, I freely give recipe I'm not uh, selfish about it at okay, all uh, caller please hello good afternoon I have another question for you uh -huh. I'd like to know earlier on you were saying that our menus are not influenced by the British and French and the Caribbean and all the problems from Africa the African thing yeah, but what are the different menus recently created by Dominicans as we speak? Let us say in the last 20 years, something that has been created by us uh, in Dominica that we can speak about, actually. Okay, I would say um, one of the things that I, I can't speak for other people, but with the same um, um, breadfruit. Um, thing that I spoke of, the, 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 the novel ways in which people are now cooking breadfruit and different pro provisions really is a way that is new. Bakes and, and, and fillings is a relatively new thing. What is also new is the fact that they roast the breadfruit, the, the bananas, especially in Koliho, they roast the bananas and they stuff them with herring and saltfish. That is new too. The plantains, yeah. And the, the, the plantain, yes. And then... Um, we also, with the, 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 the same breadfruit dough that I spoke about, I remember um, w when I used to do catering, I always tried to do at least one thing new for my clients. And one of the things I did was make stuffed breadfruit bowls, but I stuffed it with smoked herring. Mm. And it really went down very well. So these are the things that we do. Pate banan is something that, um, you know, we we we, knew, we 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 relatively new. We long ago that was not was done. That was done. We also have things like um, the, the, from the other cultures that we have started doing, like roti. We we doing the chow mein now, which is of course the Chinese um, thing, and so we are doing um, wraps, which is Mexican and so on. So we we we. We are open in our way to marrying the, 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 the other um, cultures, um, cuisine into ours. So all of these are new. Um, I'm not averse to the idea of, you know, bringing in other cuisines. But um, I am a bit alarmed. Not only, uh, when the, not only it is that when they bring in these other cuisines, they, they, they seem to, the, that of itself is lost. The purity of what they're bringing in is lost. We're losing what, how we do stuff as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that is of greater concern to me. Now, as I said in the opening, we're in the independent season. Mm -hmm. This is the food time. Mm -hmm. This is the Creole food time. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the dishes you would certainly recommend to us that we must partake in for okay. this season? Well, I, I like to start with my desserts. <laughs> you must have your, 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 your bread, bread pudding, okay? Bread pudding. Yeah, I like bread pudding. I also like to do um, sweet potato pudding and cassava pudding as desserts. I like to do the sweets as well. The, I, the, the guava cheese, coconut cheese, and all these things. I'm, so, I'm talking desserts now. When it comes to snacks, okay, I like the idea of um, the, the bakes that we do. But um, I think what, what we need to be is be, be a little more creative in the stuffing of the bakes. They do, they do um, the saltfish, 
they do the cheese, they do tuna. Yes. Hey, smoke herring. And smoke herring. But I don't think anybody has tried doing, doing the, um, the, 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 uh, crushing the avocado and doing it the way the, 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 the Mexicans do it mm. and so. That, it, it tastes quite nice, you know. And so there's that. Then you have um, as well um, the different broths that people do, the curry crabs, the crab backs. The, the, um, one of the things that I have noticed is that while um, we say that um, Kalaloo crab is our national dish, there is no standard. As many people as make it for you, it's different. I was hoping when they had this competition that crab backs would have emerged at the national dish. It is more distinctive because most of the islands do some form of kalalu, whereas the crab backs are not but as you, common. But you would have a challenge with the very, very narrow hunting period. That would have been a challenge. Eh? I just see a WhatsApp message where I say 160 um, restaurants in Ruzo from the bridge into the city. <laughs> 160. 60, yeah. that, that's an indictment on our people, eh? Who uh, <coughs> rather go out and buy a meal than cook it at their, uh, be sure of what they're eating at their home. Yes. But, but, it's, but it's good to have the restaurant. Yes, and, yes. Um, people, uh, yes but I think we need to go out more to eat, do you think? No. And to socialize? And yeah, to, well, yeah, well, and, not and, now, and, eh? When, when, co ask me when COVID is over. Right now, I think yeah. everybody should stay, stay and try uh, get a, stay away. No, we, we don't have a tradition of eating out. I mean, I no, mean, but we, we, we do that at night. Yeah. Um, we used to. People would go around at nights and, and, yeah. and buy things. And the last place you'd stop was the place where they made the, 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 the nice um, peppermint sweets. Yeah. And, that, you know, that was the dessert. And it, it had a little red blob on top. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. But so, so we have quite a list to choose from for independence um, from oh yes well definitely and 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 um you know that's the one time we shine I, I uh, pe people go all out and even if um they are mediocre at other times yeah. of the year they really go out and put yeah, out a good have, spread on june oh yes water. yes and and, and, and you know um i don't like to give things there's 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 some people who they're not in restaurants they just cook and go to certain places they are really, really good. There's somebody doing some soups. They're brilliant. Mm. Uh, you know, so we, we, we do have people who are keeping to the tradition and, and, and as they say, the real McCoy. We, we haven't talked about um, drinks yet, but, you know, we have our traditional drinks as well. Yeah. Rum, rum with puev, rum with whatever. Yeah. I, think, I think that's where we excel. I, I used to <laughs> do the bush rum, and I would put a piece of raw meat Mm -hmm. with, yes, with and, your, and, and prunes. And, and with a piece of charcoal. Yes. Yeah. I would do prunes. I would do lani. People say lani, but, but lani, I do yes. lapset. And do, filai lum, um, for I, do, I would do um, pineapple, slice, pineapple mm -hmm. slices you're from. Um, grapefruit peel, orange peel. Uh, the men like meze maui. Oh, oh, Meze Maui, oh my Maui. goodness. <laughs> well, that's the first <laughs> time I'm hearing that one. I, I, of course, you do puev. Puev, of course. Yeah, but the other thing that you use to, for the puev, lapset. for the puev is flour. It makes a ball. Oh, okay. And you, you, you still got in the room and so on. Well, let me tell you a very interesting story. When we lived in England, yeah. we had some Bajan and Dominican neighbors mm -hmm. who would take the garbage bin. Hopefully, they used to wash it well enough, mm -hmm. and they would take the wrong, the white sugar and make make rum. Mm -hmm. And one day, I just happened to have been, the, 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 the two house, sets of houses were back to back with a, a, a little track in, in between. The garbage guy came along, and he, he's telling the fellow sitting there, a Dominican fellow, where's your bin? He said, I've been here all day, where's you been? <laughs> but he was asking for his garbage bin. Eh? And, and of course, we have the sorry, we have the uh, ginger, ginger, beer. ginger beer. And let me stress again, ginger beer as opposed to ginger tea. That's, that's another thing that yeah. really doesn't take much doing. Yeah. Where you go to a restaurant and you ask for ginger beer and they bring you iced ginger tea. Yeah. Okay, ice, ginger ice. beer is fizzy. It's beer, for goodness sake. And it's very easy yeah. to make it fizz. Just as the sorrel, sorrel is supposed to be yeah. fizzy too. Yeah. But, Madam Speaker, I want to thank you very much. Any final words of advice to us? Yes, I would like to see um, the, the 100 and... 
how many? 160 60 restaurants, restaurants in Roseau and those in the environs step up their game. Mm -hmm. Do a little less of what you see on TV and the other countries and let's keep to our own. Our own is very good. Let's not discard it in favor of imported stuff. You know, and right now, with the government's influence and assistance, everybody can have a kitchen garden. And if it is a small space, just grow your seasonings. You need not grow anything else but your seasonings. You'll be happy with that. Yeah, sure. So let's use our local stuff. Let's um, <laughs> use our, um, all of the wonderful ingredients that we have. <laughs> let's eliminate um, the use of imported seasoning yes imported seasonings imported um um past and, and and green you know um one of the things that i should tell you quickly i discussed it many years with a doctor in saint lucia who said to me that the best cereal for diabetics was furin and milk, furin and milk. because yeah. apparently the, the 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 starch in the furin is not as bad as that in of the other cereals and flour and so I think there's so much for us to know and learn in this mm -hmm. country. I think Definitely. People, people like yourself will be very important in assisting us in that. I want we, to thank you, Madam Speaker. Please, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, we'll talk about the fruitcake another time. Fruitcake. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much for having, having me. Having thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope I was able to assist you all in learning about your culture. I'm learning it myself. And as I learn, I like to pass on. But I still believe you, know, you may want to go back to your TV program. Maybe once a month for once every two months or once every three months and we could do two or three dishes. And, I wouldn't and, mind at and, all. You know, so, so this would certainly be helpful to I don't to, mind at all. Many of us and so on. Uh, because as you know, there are many people who can't even boil water, I've been told. You know. These are the best <laughs> people to teach. These are the best people to teach. To, to teach. It's, it's, Definitely. It's the yes. I agree with you. Uh, I, I don't want to call names, but you know, you, you know yourselves out there. Um, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. <laughs> We'll take a short break and we'll be back. Thank you very Thank you. much for having me. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Today, the Ministry of Health, Wellness and New Health Investment would like to inform that since our last update on Wednesday, October 21st, an additional three cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed which brings Dominica to a total of 38 confirmed cases, of which nine are active cases. These three additional cases have been recorded over the past seven days. The ministry is concerned that the public has a relaxed approach to the COVID-19 pandemic and to a great extent is letting down their guards. We recognize that we are in a festive season that is celebrating our independence and several mass gatherings have been planned. However, based on the protocols which we have been outlined by the Ministry of Health, community transmission could be imminent if these protocols are not complied with. Do you know why COVID-19 is spreading fast in many other countries? It is because people are not complying with the wearing of masks and physical distancing at work and are not sanitizing properly. Persons are not enforcing the use of masks by relatives and friends coming to their homes or when hanging out with close friends at bars, crowded and enclosed places. We must all be reminded that COVID-19 is transmitted by respiratory droplets. These droplets are expelled into the air when we breathe, sneeze, cough, talk and sing. And they settle on surfaces that we make contact with. Then we touch our eyes, nose and mouth, the points of entry for the virus. The proven ways to protect yourself from the virus are to wash hands frequently with soap and water, practice respiratory etiquette, use masks, sanitize frequently touch surfaces and practice physical distancing. I also wish to inform that the Ministry of Health will commence its second round of the Community Tested Surveillance Initiative this weekend. I also wish to inform that the Ministry of Health will commence its second round of the Community Testing Surveillance Initiative this weekend in the Casabrus, Marigot, and Roseau Health Districts, while the next four health districts of Grand Bay, St. Joseph, Laplaine, and Portsmouth will be done the following weekend. 
The first community testing initiative was done during May and June this year. Everyone is encouraged to participate fully in this community testing initiative. This is the only way we are able to monitor what is happening in the community. So far, Dominica has had a commendable track record in the battle against COVID-19 with zero deaths and no one requiring critical care. And this is largely related to the efforts of the government of Dominica, the Ministry of Health, prompt and strategic response to COVID-19 and the numerous healthcare professionals and others on the front line. However, the fight is far from over and the risks continue to exist. We implore you to do all in your power to protect the most vulnerable by complying with all of the protocols that the Ministry of Health has been promoting. Wear mask, wash hands, sanitize surfaces, physical distance, boost immune system by eating healthy foods, keep informed about the latest updates, and encourage and empower others to do the same. For us to continue to be effective with our fight against COVID-19, the country needs you to play your part. I need you to play your part, please. Let us do this together. In the days ahead, I shall convene meetings with the churches, private sector entities, school principals, entertainers, among others, to review our effort to inform and educate the public. Should anyone require further information or need to make a report, please call the Ministry of Health hotline at 448-2151, 448-2153, 448-2154, Six one one four two three five one eight hundred two one nine. I thank you. Thank you very much. We just heard from our Minister for Health, uh, Wellness, and New Health Investments, Honourable Dr. McIntyre, who uh, gave us an update on Friday evening on the COVID situation. So I will address the issue of COVID nineteen in Dominica for the rest of the program. I will also uh, speak on the sitting of parliament from tomorrow and the bills and motions which will be taken before the parliament. And finally, I will give a very brief update on our efforts towards the construction of the international airport. Uh, first of all, we need to all take very good, um, careful cognizance of the recommendations of uh, Dr. McIntyre, the Minister for Health, and the caution which he has provided to us in respect to the concerns that he has as a minister and of course the, the government has um, in respect to how we are treating with COVID-19. First of all, he indicated that they, we will be starting, or we've started um, the community testing in the three health districts of uh, Cassie Bruce, uh, Marigot and Rosa. The intention is to do the other health districts to get a a clear picture, a better picture, a better assessment of how, we, how things are in so far as COVID-19 is concerned in Dominica. Um, the cases have gone up, as you, as you indicated, three cases, additional cases. Um, we are moving with contact tracing in, in those instances. Uh, and I want to commend the Ministry of Health and the, all of the uh, state entities that are engaged in in, in this operation. It's a very extensive operation and um, by and large, uh, they are very diligent in that regard. Um, but there are some concerns which the minister has raised. One, the issue of wearing our mask in public and, and, um, and the uh, hand sanitizing, and also the issue of physical distancing or social distancing. Now, we, we all agree that we have managed the COVID situation pretty well in our country. Um, but that we've always maintained should not be a reason for us to behave as if COVID-19 is over and gone. We are seeing what's happening in other regions um, where there has been a surge. Uh, we have our citizens and residents come back home we have visitors coming to our country as well. Like most countries in the Caribbean, we are all open 
our ports are all open. And the way we can play our part as citizens is to adhere to the protocols and guidelines. So if they say to us, we have to wear a mask, we have to wear a mask. There are concerns about the, um, um, the fets that are taking place. And of course, we are in the um, independent um, season. Uh, we are going to have a lot of activities. There are, many of them have been promoted and so forth. Now, I don't think there are issues with the, with the fets per se, but I believe it is how we behave at those activities that is of concern to the health officials. So there's no social distancing or physical distancing. There's no wearing of a mask. There's no hand, no hand sanitizing taking place. So we have to get to this point um, in order for us to minimize um, the risk and the threat of COVID-19 to our country. Um, we have been very transparent with the situation. We report the truth to the public at all times in respect to the um, COVID-19. But there is a general sense of we taking for granted the situation as it currently is. Now, if we do not voluntarily take action and adhere to the protocols and the guidelines, then this, the government will have no choice but to make all of these things mandatory and to um, seek parliamentary approval uh, to have certain impositions on our activities and our behavior um, in the public. As we've said, it is not in our interest in anybody's interest in Dominica, no matter who you are, or where you work, or where you don't work, um, for us to close our borders and to have restrictions on our movements. It is not in anybody's interest. And how do we prevent us from to get into that point? Simple. Wearing our masks, washing our hands, and, and uh, physical distancing. Um, and these are the things that we're asking for. Now, we're going to crank up our engagement to the public in terms of our public education again to remind us um, of these things. But we, there are certain actions, I believe, that the state must take. And so we have to bring a greater order to the hosting of activities in the public. Um, there will have to be a new application process, so you will be required to, to, to apply to, to host these events with the Chief of Police and to ensure that you adhere to the guidelines and the protocols set forth for these activities. We will have to deal with the issue of how many patrons you can have um, in the locality, in the, in the, ven at the venue that you'll be hosting these activities. So they, they, we're going to have to bring some order to the um, hosting of activities um, no one in the future. No one in the future. So we're going to have to be doing those things. Um, I don't think we are at a point where we um, should make mass mandatory by law. We will continue to appeal to our sensibilities um, to wear masks. We understand that we are, gonna be, we, we are doing it to protect ourselves, our family and the rest of the society. But I do not believe that we are very far from making the wearing of masks mandatory by law. So let's give us ourselves another week to see how we behave. If we see that we are behaving in a week's time the way we believe in now, then we will make it mandatory. And we will uh, impose a fine on people who do not wear the mask in public. The, now the other thing, washing our hands, um, People are um, adding water to the alcohol. Once you add water to the alcohol, it's of no value to you. You understand? And so we have to ensure that we have the 70% alcohol. And so the intention is to, as the minister indicated in, in his um, well-presented address to us on Friday, is that he will be meeting with, along with his um, team, with um, the various stakeholders, the entertainers, the, the church leaders, because even at funerals, you know, you go to funerals sometimes and 
And there are many people who do not wear the mask. I have, I have been to some of them. Uh, they do not wear the mask and so on. So we need to, to, to be mindful of this, that we're in the public, we're in the bus. You know, if we, if we allow the bus drivers to have uh, full capacity on the buses, then we would need to ensure that the bus driver has a mask and also those of us who are traveling in the bus would have a mask. We, we just never know. That's the point we're making. You never know um, that these things could be lurking in the bushes. You, you just do not know. And so to, we have to protect ourselves. And we, we can protect ourselves by wearing the mask. Now, I, I know sometimes we forget, we leave home. Um, and when we're well into our journey to work, we remember the mask. So we do forget sometimes the, the mask and so on. Um, and, and so we have to get this to be part of our practice you know, almost a ritual um, where we, we, we get into that groove of, of wearing the mask. I have uh, received certain recommendations from the um, technical team who, which, which advises the government on actions to be taken in respect to the management of COVID-19. I have gone through it and of course it will have to go to the cabinet on Tuesday for cabinet's approval, um, but they, they're recommending certain actions that we have to take um, to protect um, ourselves and to protect the whole country because we have to do everything possible um, to allow our restaurants to continue open, to allow our hotels to continue open, to allow our barber shops to continue open, to allow our bars to continue to open, to allow our churches to continue to open, to allow uh, our schools to continue to operate. We've been doing very well. You know, principals and teachers and staff are, are all working together to ensure that our children are safe. Um, but we have to go back to the protocols and the guidelines at all levels in the society, all levels in society. And so I'm just saying to us that we have to, um, we have to do more. I know people are expecting, are we expecting me tonight to, to, to um, announce certain um, measures, um, but I, I'm not in a position to do that. They'll go to cabinet on Tuesday. And then we will, we will seek to ratify the recommendations, all of which I am in agreement with from the technical team that I believe that we should, we should move going forward. But the issue is our behaviors. And we cannot, we cannot behave as if COVID-19 is over. And the fact is we are behaving that way. Um, and we need to recognize that we're protecting ourselves. Now, the other issue of information to the public my advice, my sincere advice to all of us is that we should rely on the Ministry of Health uh, for the information on number of cases and who we are testing and community testing and the results of those tests. Rely on the Ministry of Health. Uh, there are people who will go ahead and speak who are not authorized to speak on these matters. We have to respect um, the uh, confidentiality issues and let us not get into any state of panic. Uh, once there is a case uh, that has been picked up, the Ministry of Health moves in very quickly um, to, to start the contact tracing. But the way we can protect ourselves, like I said, and as the Minister indicated to us, wearing the mask, washing our hands, hand sanitizing, three basic things we can do. And the fact is, we were doing it very diligently um, when we, when this COVID-19 started here in Dominica, came in, I believe in March, you know, we were all walking all over with, uh, with um, our alcohol in our hands and we were spraying and wearing masks and, you know, we were washing our hands regularly. Um, but it seems that we have, we've, we've abandoned this in, in, to a great extent. And my sincere appeal to us is for us to go back to this point. Um, on another note, with respect to um, vaccines, we have um, been working with the World Bank to identify um, some resources. Just as I said before I go to the COVID-19, my hope is that in respect to community testing and, and uh, testing the population, that we can really do test about half of the population. Uh, you know, I believe the more we test, the better we know where we are. And my hope is that we can, we can mobilize the resources to test at least half of the, of the population in Dominica, um, you know, so that we, 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 we are better place. Our schools, the, 
uh, bus drivers, there were people who work in the tourism industry, the restaurants, the entertainment industry, they, they were elderly. We, we, we would test uh, across, um, uh, across some section of the population, and my hope is that we can get to, the, to, to half of the population tested. So coming back to the, to the vaccine, we, we move, we, we're looking ahead with the vaccines, recognizing that when vaccines do come on the shelves um, into the marketplace, countries like ours in, in Dominican and the Caribbean uh, would certainly be um, not at the high up in terms of having access to, to these um, vaccines. So what we're doing, we've been working with the World Bank. Uh, we've identified some resources. Um, the initial arrangement with the World Bank is for us to be able to procure um, vaccines to um, provide vaccines to 20% of our population. Um, and I am also working with them on other sources of financing to see if we, in the initial stages we can, we can increase this to about 50% of our population who will be in a position once the vaccines are in, are in place to be able to provide um, that to our populations. And of course, we'll start with the children and the, the, the um, elderly, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the most vulnerable among us. We'll start with them in terms of the vaccines. And so, so as of now, we have an understanding of the World Bank for 20% of our population. And we're working further to see if we can extend it to at least 50% of our population. The, the intention is, is, is to eventually get to 100% uh, so that everybody in, in our country would be offered um, the opportunity uh, to have the COVID-19 vaccine. So, so there are a lot of things happening behind the scenes, um, looking ahead with regards to vaccines, because this certainly would, would help us um, be able to overcome this particular challenge if, um, with, the, with the virus. So this is my intervention for tonight on, on um, COVID-19. I'm, I'm sure I'll be in a position to speak um, further on this matter by Wednesday, once the cabinet will have had the opportunity to review the recommendations of the Technical Committee. I only received it this evening, this afternoon, so um, we need to study it a little further, but I haven't read it a couple of times. I am satisfied with the recommendations that they've made, but I can't speak for the whole cabinet yet. Um, there are a number of things that will be taken to Parliament tomorrow. Um, very important um, sitting of Parliament. There are four resolutions, um, and the resolutions are to seek um, parliamentary approval for the contracting of some loans from the World Bank for a number of interventions. Uh, one of the interventions um, is in the amount of $10,206,000, and this is additional funding for the uh, Emergency Agriculture uh, Livelihoods and Climate Resilient Project. Um, so that's, that's one, one um, resolution before the Parliament. The second resolution is for additional funding under the Disaster uh, Vulnerability Reduction Project, the DVRP. As you know, we're doing the East Coast Road um, from the Emerald Pool area um, through Castle Bruce and onto the Carnegie Territory at Kinson, and it will end at Pegua. Um, when we, when we sent the um, project to tender, there were, there were two lots, two sections that we're doing, in, um, and there, were, there was a, uh, the, the tenders came back higher than the funds that we had. So we had to seek additional funding, and this additional funding is in the amount of, of $35,532,000, um, uh, so $35,532,000 for the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project commonly known as the DVRP. And then we, number three is the um, approval for the um, loans that we, we had signed a financing agreement with the, with the World Bank. We now have to get the parliamentary approval for, um, for the loan. And that is in the amount of $77,490,000 um, for the digital, digital transformation project to, to, to create the digital economy that we are, we've been working on um, diligently. Um, so we're finalizing the resources. Once we finalize these loans in the parliament, um, the funds will be um, sent to our, our bank accounts in Dominica so we can have those projects um, started. So in this case, the, the um, project um, funding will be in the amount of 
and $90,000. Um, and the fourth resolution has to do with um, um, the regional health project, uh, additional funding uh, for that, and that is in the amount of $8,316,000. Uh, um, that we seek in parliamentary approval for. Um, and of course, this will be um, used in large, large measure for our response um, to COVID-19 and the number of, of things that we need, we need to procure um, for this. Um, and the, the interest rate is three quarter of, of 1% per annum. Um, there's a commitment fee Commitment charge of half of 1% per annum. Uh, repayment is 50 semi-annual installments, uh, commencing August 15, 2020, uh, with a grace period of 10 years. So there's a grace period of 10 years on, on these loans. Uh, so we will st we'll we'll start paying, repaying these loans on August 15, 2020. Now, when COVID-19 came about, we needed to mobilize resources, and, um, and the World Bank was, was very helpful in allowing us to have access, immediate access to, to funding in order to buy medicine, PPEs, um, testing kits in some cases, um, and um, ensuring that we, <clears throat> we were properly and adequately prepared uh, to confront uh, COVID-19. So we look forward to parliamentary approval for this. And then you have um, some bills to, to be passed in the parliament one of the bills is the amendments to the title by registration act um, we had made a commitment to reduce on the transfer fees um, for property owners by about 40 percent and um, we are seeking we'll be seeking parliamentary approval to put this into effect this should be this will be in effect for 14 months and it will come into that's coming to effect on the 1st of october so we're seeking parliamentary approval for this and of course Tied into this um, amendment to this bill is the uh, a bill for an act to amend um, the Stamp Duty Act. Um, so that is that ties in with the land transfer um, arrangements that we made a commitment to in Parliament. And of course, we had given some deferments on the payments of income tax and, and income tax submission. So we'll be amending the Income Tax Act to allow for, for this um, policy decision to become law. Um, we also will be amending the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank Act. Um, that is, uh, is a, it's a, it's a simple amendment, but very critical um, to give the central bank greater oversight on, on, um, on the commercial banks within the region. And of course, we'll, be, um, how we'll have the, for, the, for the second and third readings of a bill for an act to provide for a fair and an accurate credit reporting system within the financial system in order to uh, assure objective credit decisions. Um, for banks to lend to you, they must have information on yourself. And, and the whole idea is to, is to create a more transparent system uh, to allow for um, credit information to be, to be had. And of course, to enable credit information sharing and reporting to provide for the regulation of the conduct of credit reporting and credit reporting services to provide safeguard for data protection for customers of credit providers, to provide for a single space in the regulation of credit reporting and related matters. And then we have um, uh, for second and third readings of a bill for, for an act to amend the evidence ordinance of uh, chapter 64. Um, this is to enhance the process of the courts and to, and to ensure that justice um, can be improved and um, certainly um, the efficiency of the delivery of justice will no doubt be enhanced um, by the amendments um, that we're providing. Of course, the ministers will give uh, details of these um, amendments uh, during the presentations and introduction of these bills. Then we have, finally, for second and third readings of a bill for an act um, for the amendment of the Drugs Prevention of Misuse Act, Chapter 4007, uh, that is in the decriminalizing of a certain quantity, I think 28 grams um, of cannabis, um, marijuana. Um, this is all part of a, of a justice reform program that um, 
uh, people who are in possession of 28 grams or less, uh, that they will not be, be charged and prosecuted, and these things can be on their records for, for, for the rest of their lives. Um, so we are going to Parliament to have um, an amendment to, the, to, to, this, to, this, um, to this Act and, and to allow people to be able to have in their possession and for the use for religious purposes and other purposes uh, 28 um, grams of, um, of marijuana. And I believe in this amendment we will also allow for, I believe, a couple of trees, um, persons to be able to have a couple of trees planted on their, on their private um, premises. Um, you know, and of course there'll be conditions set. So, if you are 18 and younger, you can't smoke it. You are not to be in possession of this. So this is uh, this will be part of the amendments. And of course, there'll be other conditions that you can't smoke in the public. You can't smoke on the bus. Um, everybody's on the bus. You can't smoke on the bus, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but this is not. We're not passing this legislation. From my view, this is not being presented to Parliament. Um, to quote unquote free up the herb as we as we say in anything, um, in, in it is really about um, um, not prosecuting people um, for the possession of 28 grams or less, and uh, this is a progressive move by the government. Um, and the next step is to look at marijuana from a medicinal standpoint, and the the bigger. Um, legislative agenda on this, and this will come later down. But we made a commitment in our, our manifesto and also in the budget address um, of 2020, and we go to Parliament to amend the legislation uh, to allow for this to happen. And I'm, I'm very happy um, that has been done, and um, it will be certainly a great day for the country um, that we can um, have this um, passed in. in in law, and um, and persons whose records uh, reflect um, the 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 the, um, the charges and the convictions that will also be expunged from your records, and you will be free to go about your life, um, you know, with a with a clean slate um, in terms of your criminal records and so on. Um, the other thing I wanted to briefly before I leave is on the international airport. You know, there'll always be misinformation and attempts to derail the project. I don't know why that is the case, but people get motivated by these things. People are not interested in facts. They're not interested in, in correct information. They're not interested in accurate information. Um, they're all about seeking to undermine this country's efforts towards its economic um, advancement, you know, um, and it's unfortunate. And so there's a lot of, there a lot of misinformation there. I can say to the property owners in Wesley, as I've said to them, I met with them collectively, I also met with them, I met with many of them one-on-one, -on -one, that you will not be worse off having given up your properties to allow the state to build this airport that can assure your children and grandchildren of a possible better future. With, 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 with greater opportunities with the construction of this international airport. And the people who really have properties in Wesley um, and Eden and these areas have all been very cooperative, very, very cooperative. But there are elements who, one, uh, have no properties for, uh, that, that are in the airport path um, and who have no connection to Wesley um, are seeking to, to um, to create confusion. But the people of Wesley are, are, more, are, are certainly much brighter than that, and they have not been falling for these things. So they've been talking also about um, the site of 19, of, um, that the United Workers Party has selected. We, we brought in, um, um, about eight years ago, we had reviewed that site, and it was ruled as not being a correct site. And then I, we decided as a government to bring in an American film. And I didn't, go, I didn't go to China, I didn't go to Venezuela, I didn't go to Cuba because uh, people would have said, okay, well, these people are scary friends and they'll just say, the, this site is, is good, this is the best site. I went to the United States of America and we selected one of the most reputable firms um, in the United States of America. And I said to them, look, you're professionals, 
this is the country, study the country and come back and advise me, advise this government, advise this country on what is the best location for the international airport. And they spent several months here studying uh, Dominica and looking at the various sites. And they came back with this location with three recommendations for the um, path of the runway. And they advised us on which would be the, 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 the best of the three. And we went ahead with the recommendation. That's how very professionally done. Um, very well done, professionally done, independently done. And we accepted this. The uh, people are saying, oh, this is the, the runway would be shorter than Douglas Charles and big planes won't be to land. The, the, the runway will be, I believe, about 9,500 feet in length. And we are, we are going to be building this, this, this runway in order to accommodate some of the biggest planes are available. Understands we're building for the future. Um, so let people talk. We are focused on this. We there are a number of things that are happening in the government system um, in preparation for this airport. And um, I continue to trust in the Lord that He will help us with this airport. Uh, we need this airport for a number of reasons. Uh, there's no need, no need for us to uh, articulate the, the justification for this. Um, and we are going to build this airport with um, very minimal, minimal um, demands on the taxpayers of Dominica. You understand? Very minimal demands on the taxpayers of Dominica. And uh, I am confident that this is the best opportunity the country has had to build an airport. And this will be the last opportunity the country will have to build this airport. And we will make it happen, and we just have to remain faithful to the cause and focus on, on this. And we are speeding up on the negotiations with the property owners, and um, I am sure they all will be satisfied with what they finally negotiated and so on. There, there are some lawyers, I understand, who are all there who say to property owners, you know, don't, don't speak to the government unless you get me involved. But all they want to do is to get a 3% or 5% from, from, your, from, your, um, from your sale. What, the, the, that's 3% you should be leaving for your grandchildren. These lazy lawyers want to get this from you, just like that. I mean, when you can negotiate, you, 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 you negotiate, to, you negotiate to, um, to buy a land in the first place yourself. And you negotiated the government. Many of you have settled and you uh, with the government. So I, I, this attempt by some people to, to undermine. And, and if, people, if people are serious about, if they say they're serious about this, and I know some of the, some of the, some of the, some of the people who are part of this um, thing, and if you, if you say you're part of a committee that deals with development and so forth, why are you anti developing the project? Your first, uh, your first move is to undermine the project? I, I don't understand this. Um, is this politics we're playing, or we just do not want to see our country move forward? Um, or we, do, we, do, we do want to deny young people of better opportunities, all these young people who are studying overseas, you know, how are we going to create better opportunities for them if we don't expand the economy and, and, and create um, better paying jobs and, and new jobs, new opportunities for, for young people, you know, and the, the huge opportunities that can come about not only during the construction, but after the construction of the airport. Let's move forward. We're talking about an international airport in the period of COVID-19. Can you believe this? Can you understand how good the Lord has been to us? Notwithstanding COVID, we're here talking about the international airport. And we should all be, be hating this and, and, and thanking the Lord for this. But instead, we want to curse uh, the, the candle in the dark. Thank you very much, my friends. Um, let's wear our masks, wash our hands, um, and social distancing. The feds that we're having, we have to follow some protocols. So very early, Monday, Tuesday, we will be articulating some new protocols and guidelines for an application process if you're to host an activity. And the Noise Abatement Act has to be fully um, um, and recognized. Um, and of course, we know what the Noise Abatement Act says in terms of the conduct of, 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 of night parties and activities. So we have to do this to protect this country because it is not in our interest 
to have this country shut down. If this country shut down, then we have a problem. Um, and I don't intend on, on closing this country. Um, we have to press ahead. We have to be uh, mindful of the presence of COVID-19, but we have to forge ahead nonetheless. And we have to bring about discipline and responsibility. Discipline and responsibility. And each of us, we can't rely on Ms. Dr. McIntyre and the Ministry of Health and the government. All of us, each of us must play our part. And we're asking you to do three things, three little things. We're not even asking you for money. Three little things that we have to do. Let us do these three little things to protect ourselves, our family, and our country. Thank you very much for listening to me. Really a pleasure being here with you again tonight. Um, we're committed to being with you. It's the independent season. Let us enjoy and partake in our local activities and our cuisine. And let us um, be, as always, our neighbor's keeper. Thank you very much. God bless you. Social distancing means solidarity. Play your part to help control the spread of COVID-19 and keep yourself and others safe. Limit social gatherings. Avoid crowded areas like bars and restaurants. Keep three to six feet away from each other. We may have to stay apart, but we're all in this together. A message by the Health Promotion Unit of the Ministry of Health, Wellness and New Health Investment, Dominica.